Back with our next local update at 8.55. Back now at 8.30 on this uh, morning after. It's a Wednesday morning. It's September the 12th, the day after a 911 that will um, not be soon forgotten. You're looking towards uh, the southern tip of Manhattan. Obviously, as the banner shows, that's a live picture, and you are still seeing uh, smoke rising up from the southern tip. Part of that is uh, still some of that pulverized concrete that uh, was generated by uh, the World Trade Center and uh, another building, the building number seven coming down. And part of that is the ongoing fire in the uh, basement of where the World Trade Center once stood. Temperatures there are predicted to be between 1,000 and 2,000 degrees. It's, it's an incredible scene, even this morning, the smoke still lifting. And, and, and to think about that this happened just about 24 hours ago. It's, it's amazing. amazing. The, the world and many Americans have this image of New York City, which is, is not terribly inaccurate. That is, that it is this crowded, bustling metropolis that is full of energy. Well, that is the normal New York City, but New York is anything but normal on this morning. Instead, there is, there is shock, there is disbelief, there are empty streets, there are empty highways, there are closed buildings, there are closed stores and restaurants. Um, and it, it's safe to say that people are scared, you know? People they're are walking scared. walking around, they're off the street. They're off the streets for the most part. I mean, We're this looking, is unusual. This is right outside our front door. This is the corner of 59th and 5th. You are looking west on uh, Central Park South. And normally at this time, that is a cacophony of horns, and it is congested with cabs and, and street traffic. And instead, what do we see? Two vehicles and maybe a handful of uh, pedestrians. Essentially, the city has shut down. That's what's going on in New York City this morning. Frightening stuff. For the first time in history, too, the uh, nation's airports are shut down on this uh, Tuesday morning, and they are not expected to open for air travel until later today. Until noon at the earliest was the word that we had heard some time ago. Cynthia Bowers is in Chicago with the latest on that. Cynthia, good morning. Good morning, Brian. O'Hare has been eerily quiet so far this morning. Snow plows actually blocked a lot of the entrances to the airport overnight. Now, passengers were told they could begin returning at 8 o'clock this morning for their flights, but nobody knows what to expect. Delta Airlines has already announced on its website it will not fly at all until at least 6 p.m. tonight, and that includes the Delta Shuttle and the Delta Express. The other airlines, including United, which is headquartered here at O'Hare, will still apparently try to resume operations at noon Eastern in some form or fashion. But it's going to be a daunting task. Experts say Tuesday's ground halt was uncharted territory and may affect as many as 40,000 commercial and private flights per day. Hundreds of flights yesterday were ordered to land at the nearest airport, and passengers were stranded overnight in strange places, and planes and crews were left out of position to try and resume operations today. Now, as the flying public knows, something as simple as a thunderstorm in Chicago can wreak havoc on the air travel system for several days, so straightening things out after this will take a lot longer. Then there is the other much bigger concern, and that is safety. The FAA met with airline officials reportedly yesterday who supply their own security to try and see what they can do to guarantee better security, which was breached at three major airports yesterday. Transportation Secretary Norma Mineta has ordered tighter security at all U.S. airports and has put a ban on curbside check-in. More high-tech explosive scanners will likely be in use. Non-ticketed passengers will probably not be allowed to go to the gates, and there will be more passenger profiling to try and identify terrorists. Now, would any of these measures have prevented yesterday? Probably not. Bryant. Cynthia, real quick, I heard you say that um, they were telling passengers they could return to the airport at 8 o'clock. Does that mean that the uh, noon return to service is a go? Can you confirm that? We cannot. That is what they are planning to do. I mean, some airline officials have said privately that they're not sure at all that that's going to happen. I mean, I think that that's the hope, but there are no guarantees on anything at this point. All right. Cynthia Bowers in Chicago, thanks very much. Los Angeles International Airport was among the airports that were forced to close on Tuesday as a precaution, as all airports in the States and Canada were. Vince Gonzalez is at LAX with more. Vince, good morning. Good morning, Brian. One of the world's busiest airports, LAX, remains shut down and silent this morning, except for military aircraft and a few police helicopters. The skies around us have been empty. Now, flights may resume later today, but last night there were serious questions about whether officials here or anywhere in the country can guarantee the safety of the traveling public.
Isn't this a wake-up call that the security, especially the screening of passengers, obviously needs to be improved in the uh, United States? I don't think it's appropriate to speculate on what caused this and where the problem is. But a review of government records reveals serious problems with America's airport security. The two airlines involved in yesterday's terrorist attack have been repeatedly cited for security violations. In the last six months of 2000, American Airlines was fined more than $400,000 for 49 incidents. United Airlines was fined $356,000 for 38 incidents. Just a month ago, the FAA proposed fining American Airlines an additional $99,000 for security violations at several airports, including Boston's Logan Airport, where two of yesterday's doomed flights originated. And from 1997 to 1999, Logan Airport and airlines operating there were cited at least 136 times by the FAA for violations, including passenger screening problems, allowing weapons through checkpoints, and letting unauthorized people into secure areas. In a separate investigation in May, federal agents with fake badges or IDs purchased on the Internet penetrated the most secure areas of America's federal buildings and airports. After a series of security breaches at Los Angeles International Airport, a reporter from KCBS-TV went undercover in 1999. Is security so loose that it's possible for a terrorist to get a weapon on an airplane? We found out it's not only possible, in some cases it's easy. Security staff failed to properly check passengers. A producer posing as a traveler in a wheelchair was pushed around metal detectors and not adequately inspected. The government says security staff is poorly trained and many make less than fast food workers. Now, after those reports aired, LA officials said security was tightened at Los Angeles International Airport, but experts tell us no matter what level of security you may have, nothing will stop a determined suicidal terrorist who's intent on bringing down a plane. Brian? Vince, when are you hearing LAX might reopen? We really haven't heard very much. We're told that officials are huddling, trying to come up with a plan. The big problem is getting people back in, then letting passengers know they can come, and then the real problem becomes getting planes to key hubs, key points where they can then begin getting people home. Okay. All right, Vince Gonzalez, thanks very much. Something tells me uh, delays are going to take on a whole new meaning starting today, Jane. I think so. For more on airport security, Brian, let's turn now to Michael Boyd. He's an aviation consultant in Denver. Mr. Boyd, good morning to you. Good morning. A lot of finger pointing going on this morning. In your opinion, who is to blame for this apparent lapse of uh, security? Well, when you have three airports and four hijackings, the only common thread there is you know, FAA procedures. So we can take shots at everybody here, but overall, we do have a major problem with the FAA security. You have said that to a trained <laughs> terrorist, U.S. airports have the security of a laundromat. What should be done differently? Well, one thing is just like those previous, uh, the previous piece showed, it's a case of awareness of security, where you take it seriously and not like it's something that gets in your way. Uh, it doesn't have to be something that shuts down our system. As a matter of fact, if we do any knee-jerk stuff right now uh, that, that gums up our, our air transportation system, those terrorists won again. It's just mainly a matter of just being aware of security, wheelchairs that go through where people could put a gun underneath, uh, catering trucks coming on the field, things like that. Those are, that's the sort of thing that needs to be addressed and addressed very quickly. Well, how much responsibility do airports have and how much responsibility do airlines have? Everyone has a responsibility if you have a secure area or a sterile area, certainly. But some of these things, like finding an airline because they didn't ask grandma if she's carrying her bag or if she's packed her own bags, that's not real security. The real issues here are, are, are checking IDs like you just saw. Those kinds of things, those can be fixed very quickly and need to be fixed very quickly. Do you think that these airlines, uh, Mr. Boyd, and these airports were targeted for specific reasons were they more vulnerable than other places well i think because of their proximity to the targets yes they were but uh any airport especially a big airport is is, is can be a target for anyone but like the piece just said a trained terrorist you're gonna have a hard time uh avoiding uh, uh terrorist activities but tightening up uh security is an issue of awareness it doesn't have to be something where the FAA puts in new procedures that basically gums up our whole system. Well, what's the lesson here, Mr. Boyd? What should we take from this to go forward? 
Well, going forward, let's understand we have to have accountability. Um, there, there were lapses at three airports, at four hijackings here, and just having hearings where the FAA says, well, we're sorry, we're going to do something about it, doesn't work. We've got to hold people accountable right now and make sure this doesn't happen again. Let's hope not. Aviation consultant Michael Boyd, thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. 8.39 Eastern Time. Brian. All right, Jane. President Bush has declared a major disaster in New York and has dispatched federal emergency teams to the area. Joseph Albaugh is the director of the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Mr. Albaugh, good morning. Morning, Brian. Um, what are your marching orders this morning? Give me an idea of, of what's high on your to-do list. I'm here this morning making sure we have the necessary personnel deployed to Northern Virginia, to the Pentagon, and to New York City. Yesterday, I activated, after the President's declaration, 12 uh, urban search and rescue teams out of our 28 nationally. Eight will be coming to New York City. They're either on the ground or on their way right now. Four here to Northern Virginia. Uh, I'll be briefing Congress later on this morning. I'll see the President here in about 45, 50 minutes, and then I'll be making my way to New York City. I have spoken with uh, Governor Pataki, uh, Governor Gilmore, Mayor Giuliani. Uh, uh, we're there to assist their needs. My biggest concern, Bryant, are those folks who have been working now almost 24 hours at this situation. They're getting tired, and we need to make sure that we roll in mm -hmm. fresh troops, because there are folks, I believe, that we can still find alive. So the people you've dispatched to New York and the Pentagon are basically in what, an investigative capacity? No, no, no. These are highly trained uh, search and rescue individuals, mainly made up of fire department personnel from uh, all across the United States. They bring technical assistance, they bring dogs, and uh, they'll be the folks mm -hmm. uh, uh, helping uh, the New York Fire Department go through the rubble in New York City. I know you're hearing um, from officials in, in New York and D.C. What are you hearing about the needs? Let's start with New York. What, what, what's most needed right now? This morning when I spoke with Governor Pataki, he was concerned about power. Uh, they need power in lower Manhattan. Uh, to make sure that the search and rescue operation can continue. We're trying to make sure that they have the necessary uh, portable generators to take care of. I'd like to make sure that those who have been uh, immediately harmed or in need of uh, assistance would call our 800 number uh, f to get registered. That will start the flow of, uh, of federal dollars to those individuals for individual and family assistance. That 800 number is 800-462-9029. And uh, I appreciate your help, Brian, in getting that word out. Okay. And, and in terms, in terms, Mr. Alba, of, of supplying the generator needs, do you have the resources to give New York Absolutely. all it needs? Absolutely. I'm the president's representative to make sure that all the federal assets that New York and, and Northern Virginia need will be present. And are the needs in, uh, in the Northern Virginia area quite a bit different than those in New York? Somewhat different, but we're attacking this problem in both communities the same way. All right. And let me give that number again one more time. It is 1-800-462-9029. That's anyone in need of FEMA assistance can at least get the ball rolling. Is that That's correct? That's correct, Brian, and I appreciate your help. All right, Mr. Albaugh. Good luck to you, sir. See you soon. All righty. 843, Jane. Brian, the World Trade Center was at the heart of New York's and this country's financial district. For a look at the impact on the business community, let's bring in Harvey Pitt now, chairman of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. He's in our Washington bureau. Mr. Pitt, good morning. Good morning, Jane. New York uh, markets will not open today. What kind of impact will, have, will that have globally? I don't think it will have um, a significant impact. We've been in touch um, uh, not only with domestic markets, but world markets, and they have been prepared for this. Um, I think this is a, a, a day of taking assessment, and it's um, our hope and expectation that the markets will resume operation um, uh, tomorrow or as soon as possible, but I believe it will be tomorrow. So Asian markets not affected today? I don't think that they will be um, uh, dramatically affected. Uh, they understand uh, uh, what is happening uh, here. I think those markets are opening and um, they understand that on instruments that they trade or from which their prices derive um, from our markets, uh, they are going to have uh, some difficulties. But other than that, I think they will be fine. I suspect, uh, Mr. Pitt, you've been in contact with financial uh, powers around the world um, for the last 24 hours. What kind of conversation? conversations have you been having? What have people been saying to you? Well, I think um, uh, people have all been uh, very responsive. Uh, this is um, uh, unfortunate, obviously, but our markets are incredibly resilient. 
I've spent a lot of time on the phone with um, the major market centers. Uh, the president uh, has a working group that consists of Treasury and the Fed and uh, the CFTC and the SEC. And we have been coordinating uh, all of our activities to make sure uh, that any place that any uh, questions can arise, uh, we're prepared to respond to them. Well, what impact do you believe this might have generally on our economy as a whole? Um, I think that um, it, it should have a minimal impact. Uh, there's obviously an emotional component to this, and that's very understandable. Uh, but I think people understand that we have the strongest and deepest markets um, in the world. But we're uh, already in a time of economic uncertainty. Won't this tragedy plunge us into a, into a real recession? I don't think that this tragedy will plunge us into a recession. I think that people um, will want to uh, proceed slowly at first and uh, uh, learn where um, uh, a lot of our issues are. But I don't think that uh, we're going to be plunged into a recession because of this. And advice, uh, lastly, here in our last 10 seconds, for investors as we move forward. I think investors should understand that there are some very special values out there. Special values. Special values that this is a time to be positive about our markets. Well put. Harvey Pitt, thank you very much. Thank you. 8.45. Bryant. All right, Jane. CBS News correspondent Carol Marine was a block away from the World Trade Center when the second tower collapsed. It's good to see you. It is good to, uh, to be here. You almost didn't make it. You know, that's, that's, that's the closest I've ever come, absolutely. What happened? Talk to me, take me through it. I was over at the 60 Minutes 2 offices when the first tower got hit, and it was early in the morning, and there weren't many of us around, and I heard, they said, Scott Pelley and a crew are racing there, and, you know, by training, by instinct, something happens, you go. I said, I'm jumping in a cab, I'll, I'll get there, I, I'll help who's ever on the ground, I can field produce, whatever. A cab let me out many, many blocks from it because it's as far as we could go, and I walked. Um, I saw the first tower go down. Um, I made my way around Gramercy Park. That must have been an unimaginable sight. It was unimaginable, I, and I was on, cell phones were dead. <coughs> I was frantically calling right, all Right, all cell phone my, service here was out all, of it. All my numbers, I finally hit a Chicago number, and my producer, Don Mosley, in Chicago, and I said, I'm here, I'm on the ground, and then I went, oh my God, because the first tower came down. I got around Gramercy Park. I was one of the only civilians on this desolate street. You didn't even see wounded on the street, just paramedics with stretchers waiting. And a firefighter said, go on through. I, was, I said, you've seen a CBS crew? He said, no, but walk down the middle because debris is falling. And then he turned and screamed, oh my God, run. And we saw a fireball rolling towards us as a building it must have been the base of the second building coming down. Fireball, but generally, but the first or the second? I think the second, um, because my watch, I saw the first go down, so it had to have been some aspect of the this second. This is a look at the second one going down. This is a view from, obviously, on the other side of, uh, of the river. Go ahead. It was either that or a gas line ignited at the base of what went down, but it was a huge rolling fireball uh, at street level, at eye level and up. And I fell, I ran and fell, and some firefighter scooped me up, and we ran some more, and then a firefighter slammed me into a, a cement marble wall, covered my body with his, and, and I could feel his heart beating through my backbone, and I thought we were dead. I mean, I thought we weren't going to beat this fireball. We somehow did, and then instantly what rained down was the densest, it was like atomized um, particle board. You were breathing things and you couldn't see, could not see, could not breathe. And I felt, and he handed me off to a police officer and we hand in hand tried to make it through. Uh, he said, cover your face with your hand and try not to breathe. I thought, you know, the fire didn't get us but the smoke will, and I've covered enough fires to know firefighters don't make it through that stuff. We somehow got to a little more light, and then we were out of it. Um, a firefighter took off his um, sort of gas mask and put it on me for a minute so I could breathe for a second. I hit a police line and crossed over to a CBS satellite truck and worked there for a little bit and then thought, I've got to get back here at the broadcast center when firefighters began running down the street screaming a gas line's gonna blow and emergency vehicles were turning around and tearing down the street I pounded on one they threw me in and got to 42nd Street where a New York City bus driver stopped his empty bus 
and drove me back here to CBS. The, um, the firefighter injury? I don't know, Bryant. I, His name? I don't know. Um, he was gone before. Uh, the, the police officer was a, uh, Brendan Duke. I remember that. The bus driver was Bill McRae. I remember that. The firefighter was gone before I could say much more than thank you so much. And he was gone back in. Um, so as I hear that 300 firefighters have perished, there's this nameless firefighter who I don't know is alive or dead, but who did everything he could to protect my life. And the reality is you were able to drive out of there. He probably turned around and went back. And he probably went back. You ever and come so close? I've never come so close. You know, I was in Belfast when a few things were blowing up and I've been, you know, gang stuff, all the stuff we all do. Um, uh, I've never been in something like this. You never thought you'd see a day like this? I never. I never thought I'd see a day like this. And people, you know, the, the little heroics, not even little heroics, people were walking as the tide of people were coming toward me and I was going toward the Trade Center. People were all doing everything they could. Yeah, they're coming together. It's good to see you. Thank you, hon. A lot has happened in the last 24 hours, so even as we thank Carol, we're going to uh, take a couple of moments once again to retrack and uh, take a look at some of the images of uh, September 11, 2001. It was a Tuesday morning, the start to a tumultuous day we will never forget. We saw a plane coming very low from this direction, and everyone said, wow, that plane is very, very low. And then we heard the crash, we ran to the window. The What's this other jet doing? What's what the other jet doing? Right now? Another one, another plane just hit. Oh my God! Jesus Christ! Oh, oh my God, oh. another plane has just hit. It hit another building. And I heard a roar and I looked up and I saw the second plane hit. It had to be a commercial sized airliner. I'm seeing bodies falling out of buildings. And I look up and the tower just starts crumbling down. And everybody in the street just stops and started crying and bawling. Oh, an angel! We heard a rumble like I've never heard before, and a firefighter ran towards me. We ran as fast as we could. I fell down, he picked me up and slammed me into a wall. It collapsed. The top floors collapsed down. I saw it brought blow and then ran like hell. Thank God. Take a hold, did he move the breeze? Chaos, it's just chaos out here, it really is. Okay. Where? Where? It was in the explosion. It was in the lobby, the, the third explosion, the whole lobby collapsed on us. What was it like? What was it like? Horrible. It's like Horrible. hell. You don't the want whole, to know. The whole building just collapsed on us. So the Twin Towers fall. It's amazing. Uh, today we've had a national tragedy. Uh, two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. Terrorism against our nation will not stand. A terrible, terrible tragedy has befallen my nation, but has befallen all the nations of this region, all the nations of the world. Once again, we see terrorism. We see terrorists, people who don't believe in democracy, people who believe that with the destruction of buildings, with the murder of people, they can somehow achieve a political purpose. First of all, I am offering my con condolences, the condolences of uh, the Palestinian people. What type of debris did you see? Uh, very little debris. Did you hear anyone? Uh, no, I didn't. There's, there was really nothing left. I've seen those pictures over and over. 
If you think of the worst thing that you've seen domestically, you know, the, the Oklahoma cities and, and all of these things, I mean, it's just, it, it hits you in a way you can't yeah. even describe. The emotions are so overwhelming. And, and I'm sure you did it yesterday, too. The, the, the one common thing all New Yorkers did yesterday, among many things, was they all grabbed their phones and started trying to call the people they knew. Right. Make sure they were safe. Well, and there are many people that still haven't been contacted. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are many people that I need to contact, yeah. that I haven't been able to find. It's, um, Everybody it's, is touched by this in some way. It's just remarkable. It's frightening stuff. We're coming up on uh, 8.55. Some uh, viewers are going to break away for local news. We're going to continue our coverage right here after this. Indeed, everybody uh, has been touched in some way. We are Americans, after all, and America is coming together on this day after this unspeakable tragedy. It's 8.55, and uh, Scott Wally and Carrie Connolly are rejoining you once again from our WBZ4 studios. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Yes, the chilling images obviously continue in New York City as well as for many of us here in Boston. As you know, Logan Airport is closed this morning. We have been giving you names of the many victims on the two flights that left Boston yesterday, headed to the West Coast. Um, we have been given some more tape, which I understand, brand new tape of a different um, angle of the second plane that crashed into the south tower of the World Trade Center, United Flight 175. That was the, the second one where many of us were in shock after seeing the first, and 9.03 a.m., not maybe 18 minutes later, we're taking a look at the second plane and the sounds of horror from the people on the streets of New York City. Forty-five people on board, uh, actually 65 people on board. That was United Airlines Flight 175, leaving Boston um, at 8.14 a.m. yesterday morning. Scott crashing into the South Tower at 9.03. Just to, you know, I'm sure you're, you're like me and most of you out there, you, no matter how many times you see that video, your reaction is, I can't believe that jet is hitting that building. Yeah, it, it's, it's, just, uh, it's not beyond real. Belief. Well, uh, many people who were evacuated from uh, their buildings here in Boston uh, as a safety measure are going back to work this morning. Streets were quiet yesterday in downtown Boston, starting with the Hancock Tower, the Prudential Center, obviously the high rises initially, and then the rest of downtown just cleared out. And WBZ's Christina Hager joins us now from downtown Boston with the latest this morning. Christina, I understand business as usual this morning. Well, that's the idea. People are trying to get back to business as usual, but I have to tell you, it's sort of strange out here. Every now and then we see a military aircraft flying above, and everyone just sort of stops in their tracks and looks up. It's, a, it's an eerie feeling. Behind me, you can see uh, the newsstand by the T-stop here at Copley Square, where uh, it has been crowded with people eager to read about this historic and tragic event. Federal, state, and Boston City employees back on the clock as are those who work here in the Back Bay, where thousands were evacuated yesterday. And now high-rises like the Prudential Building and the John Hancock Building are back open for business, an effort to restore normalcy, although many people we've talked to out here this morning say life will never be the way it was before yesterday. I don't think people will ever be the same. I mean, just walking around, you have to think that the way we just approach everyday life is going to change forever. Business-wise, maybe we'll get back to normal, but as a, as a civilization, I doubt it. I think it's going to be tough for a lot of people to get back to business when they've lost someone close to them and our country has experienced such a loss. I think it's going to be a long time before everyone's back 100%. It was a little bit of chaos, everybody leaving yesterday, but just have to just trust and hope that everything will be okay. Now, Acting Governor James Swift has called in stress counselors to meet with the people who work in the high-rises here in the Back Bay to help ease their transition back to work. Uh, one person we spoke with this morning put it pretty well. Today is the first day of what is definitely going to be a tough new life for everyone here. Live in the Back Bay in Boston, Christina Hager, WBZ4 News. Back to you. All right, Christina, thank you very much. Uh, let's check out uh, the weather forecast. Shelley, Barry Burbank's in the weather office this morning. Barry? Good morning, Scott and Kerry. Hi, everybody. It's a beautiful morning. It's nice and sunny, but it's on the cool side. But we're starting to warm up after early morning lows, which are down in the 40s in many spots. 
Uh, Aaron is out at sea, continuing to move away from New England, but we have cloud cover approaching from the west, and eventually that'll give us a few showers, maybe a couple scattered around tomorrow afternoon, more likely late tomorrow night and Friday morning as the cold air really becomes established. Highs today will be in the middle 70s, ranging down to the upper 60s of the coast of the light sea breeze, ba basically sunny, and a few scattered afternoon clouds. Again, we'll get most of the showers tomorrow night and Friday morning, then very chilly, only 58 for high on Friday, back to some sunshine, low to mid 60s on Saturday, sunny and milder, 65 to 70 on Sunday. And that's my latest forecast. Barry, thank you. Our continuing coverage will go on throughout the morning. We do want to head you back to New York City where the early show is now in progress on uh, UPN 38 as well as WBZ4.